I suppose people will keep on pouring in, but we will have to start this second day of HIPCON. Thank you for being here once again for another keynote session, this time by Ted Newward. Uh, a couple of service information before we kick off. So we sent out an announcement that uh, there may be some water shortages. For now we are fine, but uh, Svetogorska Street, for example, uh, uh, parts of it don't have water and uh, parts, of course, of uh, uh, city center also. And they announced that the all works will be done by noon, so I hope the, uh, it keeps us all together. Uh, also, you saw some donation boxes up, stair up the stairs uh, by HIPCON booth. Uh, our uh, uh, speaker, Nemanja, after his session at uh, 11 a.m., will be doing a brief uh, solo concert to encourage all of you to join the small party and donate, and he will also match your donations until he goes bankrupt. So, yeah, it's uh, uh, two organizations that uh, uh, donate to uh, child health care, uh, children who uh, battle with cancer. So it's a really great cause, and we would appreciate if you helped it. Uh, Ted, uh, welcome to HIPCON. Ted was also a big part of our unconference event, which we are also trying to promote uh, because we liked it that much. Ted, what were your impressions? Um, it was terrible. <laughs> okay, no, it was fun. It was we fun. Killing it. Yeah, um, you know the uh, there's always kind of a um, the, the, there's a change in in dynamic when you yeah. come down off the stage, so to speak, and it's fun just being one of a group of people sitting around with opinions. Um, so yeah, I'm 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 a fan of the whole format. Yeah. So yeah, it was good. Keynote speeches uh, on the whole other side of that. So yeah, exactly. We, 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 <laughs> we let you have both have it both ways. Uh, Ted is originally based in the U.S., but he is a global uh, a speaker and currently works for Quicken Loans. But I will uh, uh, just have him his hour now. And Ted, good luck. Thank you. So. For most of you, I imagine the first question that's going across your mind is, what the hell do I mean by polytechnical careering? This is not the English that you were taught in school. What I mean specifically about polytechnical, a few years ago, a colleague of mine by the name of Neil Ford started going around and talking to people about being a polyglot. And polyglot, of course, means multiple languages. Anybody know what you call somebody who can only speak one language? American. <laughs> just thought I'd throw that out there. But it's more than just multiple programming languages that you really want to be aware of, because when you really start thinking about it, you really also want to be very familiar with different forms of storage, right? You want to understand how the various NoSQLs behave. Uh, whether it's a graph database, whether it's a document database, whether it's a key value store, whether it's a more non-traditional relational database, they all have different implications and you kind of want to be up to speed on a bunch of those as well. And when you start thinking about where do I put the, all of this code, where do I put the, the, the data, well, we have a series of different foundations, platforms, upon which we do this, right? Obviously, we've got several cloud players in mind, Amazon, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud, et cetera. There's smaller platforms as well, Heroku and App Harbor and so forth. And then there's also, of course, the platform that we all started with, which is to say your company's platform, which in some cases may just be a PC tucked away under a desk somewhere, and please, please, please don't kick the power cord, right? By the way, if you're still doing that today, please stop. Please stop. That's a terrible platform. And so you really want to be familiar with all three of these kinds of things. You really want to have a very broad uh, skill set. Because when you are, in fact, polytechnical, when you have this breadth, you understand a variety of things that a number of people don't. If you describe yourself as a Java developer and you've never, ever, ever looked at C-sharp or F-sharp 
or Scala or Haskell or Go or Rust or any of those other things. What you're doing is you're limiting your viewpoint. You're limiting your perception. You have only just this narrow view through the keyhole that you understand. You don't see value in any of those other technologies. How could you? You've never looked at them. And you don't, uh, you, you start becoming victim to this notion that there can be a one size that fits everybody. When you start examining these different technologies, you see the differences and you realize that there is no such thing as a one size fits all. You realize that there is no technology that can solve all of your problems. More importantly, you also begin to understand that there is significant overlap between all of these technologies. And that in fact, if I go to you and say, hey, I want you to build for me a website, and you say, great, do you care what technology it is? Because Java could do it, .NET could do it, Perl could maybe do it, nah, never mind, Perl couldn't do it. What ends up happening, and it's particularly fun that I'm doing this here in Yugoslavia, um, you find yourself identifying with Karl Marx from each technology according to its abilities to each project according to its needs. The other stuff, right, the whole communist, yeah, th th it's because Karl was misquoted. This is what he actually said in the Communist Manifesto so many years ago. But this begs the question, why on earth would you want to do this? Because very frankly, you know, this is hard. This is not easy to sit down and learn new programming languages, to sit down and learn new storage technologies, this all takes time. I mean, let's be clear, if you want to study Go, you're probably gonna have to spend six months serious study time. Now, not necessarily full time, you can do this weekends and evenings and whatnot, but you, you start consuming time that is you know, potentially useful for other things like, I don't know, sleep. And, you know, where does this really leave you? Because if you spend so much time studying all these different things, I personally know probably about three dozen different programming languages, which means that I could start writing code and I would probably have to go back to a cheat sheet every so often to remember a certain syntax. And you run the risk of becoming in what we say in English, a jack of all trades, master of none. You're not great in any of them. You're okay in all of them. And let's assume for the moment that you convince yourself that that's okay, that it's all right to not be really super incredibly powerful on any one language. It's okay to actually have a broad swath of knowledge but then we start talking about if I actually use multiples of these technologies on the same project, well then I have to figure out how I'm gonna talk back and forth to one another. If I look at Python, for example, and I say, wow, Python is great, it's amazing for data science, I wanna do all this data science work in Python, and we currently run on top of the Java virtual machine, somehow I have to figure out how to get Python to run on top of the JVM, or I have to figure out how to get my Python code to talk to the JVM, I'm absolutely introducing some additional complexity into the project, and it's a fair question to ask, does it really need to be there? The other thing that we run into is as you study more of these languages, you start discovering that the way in which we think changes. The way that a Python developer approaches a problem is actually going to be somewhat different from the way that a Java developer does or the way that a .NET C Sharp developer does. And is it really worth the pain of two people sitting in a room arguing over which approach that we're going to use? Many of you work for various companies and you may have run across certain problems that show up inside your various uh, uh, projects. For example, you may have a particular project where the logic, the business logic, changes on a regular basis. You may find that there are certain problems that are complex permutations. 
Classic example here, for example, is if I have, say, 27 different possibilities and I need to figure out which one yields the best result or which one even yields a result that's possible. Think about, for example, when you buy a new computer and there are all these different options, but if you select one particular option, if you select the super nuclear graphics card for your laptop, then you cannot have the second hard drive. Or if you take the second hard drive, then you cannot have the extended battery. You think about having to code all of those possible permutations in a traditional language, and it just makes your skin crawl. In some cases, the logic that we want to work with is best done by domain experts. I work for a company that does mortgage lending. We literally lend billions of dollars every year to people in the United States so they can buy a house. There's no way in hell that I'm a mortgage banker. I have no idea all of the different products, all of the different uh, tweaks, the various points and APR and percentage rates, and eh, that's not me. So now on this particular project, if we are talking about trying to rebuild our website that will allow people to come in, sign up, and start the process to get a mortgage, and I want to present to them all of the possible options, I have to become a mortgage banker or I have to have a mortgage banker sitting with me the entire time, looking over my shoulder, constantly chatting back and forth. Now, maybe you work for a company where a business analyst will do all of that work for you. Yeah, sure you do. I'm sure the business analyst knows everything about mortgage banking because they chose to be a business analyst instead of a mortgage banker who can make like five times as much money? How do we get that domain logic out of people's heads and into code? Or in some scenarios, we run into particular cases where the requirements that we are trying to build, they don't fit a particular paradigm. This was actually a major problem in the Java world for a number of years in the late 90s, early 2000s. And a lot of the Java technology moved into the financial space where a lot of the financial space is built around transactions. Tell me, how do you model transactions in objects, particularly if you're trying to do a domain-driven design? Where are the nouns in a transaction? We struggled with this for quite some time. Sun tried to give us a transactional technology. It was called Enterprise Java Beans. And quite frankly, so many of the developers who were trying to use EJB didn't understand that it was about transactions, it was not about objects, that EJB was effectively poisoned in a technology, not because it was terrible, well, no, it was, but because we didn't understand what it was trying to accomplish for us. The last scenario that you may run across is you have a disparate team. You've basically decided to go do some volunteer work, and here are a bunch of volunteers that are working with you, and none of you share the same programming language. One of you is a .NET, one of you is Python, one of you is Java, one of you is Perl, one of you is C++. Any of these sounding familiar? These are problems that routinely show up in a lot of the projects that I've been on, quite frankly. How do you solve them? Well, if the logic changes on a regular basis, one of the things that we as software developers really stress is the idea that when we release something to production, it is tested, it is solid, it is good. We make sure that it in fact works. And as a result, historically, we have deliberately, in some cases, introduced delays. Now, the whole DevOps movement, I understand, the whole idea is that we will eventually, you know, get to a point where we can ship code on, say, a daily basis. Just a quick, real quick show of hands, how many people ship code on a daily basis? I see five hands out of maybe 50, 100 people. Okay, cool, that's great for you guys. The rest of us, however, in many cases, we move too slowly for the business. 
And the business, in many cases, the changes that they want to make are pure business logic changes. In theory, there's no change to anything in storage. There's no change to any of the actual processing that takes place. Or worse, they want to change the logic, or they have to change the logic because of external factors. If the government decides tomorrow that it is no longer legal to lend to people in certain parts of the country, we have to implement that regardless of where we are in the sprint cycle. Now, hopefully the government gives us a little bit more of a heads up, but sometimes things happen and we have to figure out a way to change that logic on a dime. Answer, what if we in fact create a engine, if you will, inside of the application that allows end users, that is to say the business folks, to be able to make their own changes. Think about this, it's an e-commerce platform that you're building and the marketing department wants to stand up a special because suddenly the Rambo movie is taking off and they want to offer a special deal. Anybody buying the Rambo movie also gets a Rambo t-shirt for free. If they wait for the standard week or two weeks, we might miss this window and so you give them a scripting engine, whether it's something that's built in JavaScript or Lua even, which is a language that is frequently used to script video games. Because when you're a video game, you build your engine and then you build the levels in a scripting language around the engine so that the level designers can tweak and tune and create new downloadable content, new skins, new themes, new characters, etc., without having to modify the core engine. Same principle, different industry. Or you've got that problem of complex permutations. The laptop design problem I mentioned earlier. How many people here have done Sudoku? Right, the number problem? Yeah, a fair number of us. How many of you would write a Sudoku solver in your favorite programming language, Java? I got like maybe one hand and then he looked around and went, oh shit, nobody else is raising their hand and he quickly put it back down again. This is not easy when you think about it, particularly if you're using the wrong programming language. See, that particular kind of problem, Sudoku, is what's known as a constrained logic problem. And there are actually programming languages, Prolog, that are specifically designed for that kind of problem. If you've ever worked with a formal rules engine, a Reedy graph engine, you're also in the same space. And a lot of the original rules engines were designed to support expert systems when we were doing artificial intelligence back in the 80s. Yeah, by the way, kids, for those of you who haven't lived through one of the three cycles of AI hype, We've been here before. So take your machine learning and just hold on to it because it doesn't mean that now AI is going to be great. I, everything I hear about machine learning, I heard about expert systems back in the late 80s. And everything about that, we heard about natural language processing back in the 60s. So just cool your jets a little bit with the whole AI thing, all right? Constrained logic is definitely a solvable problem if you've got the right tool. What happens when we talk about domain experts? Well, in some cases, what we really should be thinking about is how do we create something that is intrinsically the language of mortgage? When I go and sit and talk to a mortgage banker and I start thinking and I start talking and I start listening, and they're talking about points and percentages and so forth, is there a way for me to generalize this, not necessarily into a Turing complete programming language, that's not the point. The world has enough Turing complete general programming languages, but can I build something that allows them to express their ideas, their products, their initiatives, et cetera, in a syntax that is comfortable to them? We see domain-specific languages all over the place. If you've ever been to Starbucks and ordered a coffee, you walk into Starbucks and say, I'll have a large coffee, right? No, that's not what they do. What is it? It's a vente grande, double shot, no whip. What the hell is that? I'm not a coffee guy. I don't order from Starbucks, right? 
Now, if we want to talk about Diet Coke, that's a whole different story. Starbucks has a domain-specific language so that you can get exactly what you're interested in drinking. If you've ever been to the United States, particularly the southern part of the United States, you understand that there is this institution called Waffle House. Waffle House, ladies and gentlemen, if you've never been, it is best experienced at two in the morning while drunk. But they have a whole variety of different ways that you can get your potatoes. You can get them scattered, scattered, smothered, covered, I forget all of it. There's like 47 different ways that you can get your Waffle House grits. Or if you're not really a uh, you know, late night drunk breakfast kind of person, there is a fast food chain in the US called In-N-Out. All they do is hamburgers. And they have a secret menu. They won't actually show you. It's never printed there. But if you know, you walk into an In-N-Out and say, I'll have a double-double, animal style. What that means is you get it with grilled onions. And they've got it protein style, and they've got all kinds of different ways to do this. Right? Protein style is where you get the patties, but it's in lettuce as opposed to a bun. Worst idea ever, quite frankly. But hey, these are all domain-specific languages. Why wouldn't we, as developers, create tools that our domain experts can utilize directly in order to best express the ideas that they want to convey, as opposed to trying to bounce it through our heads and into code? Why don't we take those concepts, create a tool around those concepts, and give it over to them and say, have fun, party. And you can do all of these things without my involvement whatsoever. And in some scenarios, we have relationships that just don't fit. How many people have done that ancestry thing where you like swab your DNA and send it off to God knows who and they track your ancestry, right? This is becoming a really popular thing in the US. And as a matter of fact, if you really want to see all of your family relationships, the place you really want to be, believe it or not, is Salt Lake City, Utah. The Mormon church has actually made a business out of tracing all of your genealogical roots as far back as they can go. Now think about that for a moment from a data modeling perspective. Think about a genealogy, a family tree, with the fact that you know, obviously you have a biological mother and a father, each of whom has been divorced three times, right? And then they, of course, also have siblings, some of whom have been divorced, some of whom were born and died and so forth. And remember that particularly if you're from the American South, not only is it okay to marry the same person twice, because, you know, the first time it didn't work, and then, you know, you got divorced, and then one day you ran into each other in the grocery store, and you hooked up, and suddenly now you're getting married again. But it's even more fun when she's your sister. How are you going to model this? How are you going to store this data? Seriously, if you really think of yourself as a relational database expert, this is a hell of a challenge. How are you going to store this? Because remember, we have these individuals, and we can have not only a relationship with another individual, but we can have that relationship multiple times. And we can have multiple relationships. It's even more interesting when you try to do this to the royalty of Europe. Because you think marrying your sister is a joke, it wasn't for the royalty of Europe. There it was necessary for various reasons of state. Now, a relational database, despite the fact that it's all about relationships, will fail miserably when trying to do this kind of problem. But you know what does it really, really well? Graph database. Graph database, each individual forms nodes, and then we can have arcs between the nodes where the arcs are, in fact, their own atomic data element where we, in fact, can attach data to those arcs. So if I get married to Charlotte, we can actually attach a starting date and an ending date, and we can actually attach arcs 
from myself and my wife to our two, to our two kids who are grown now, and if they, all of these just become this huge graph of arcs, you know who's made a business out of a graph database? Facebook. Fundamentally, Facebook is one giant ass graph database. That's all they really are. Everything else is window dressing. And if you've got that disparate team that's got all these wide variety of skills, well, you can always already start to figure out where I'm going with this. Let each contribute as they can from each technology according to its abilities to each project according to its needs. So you let the Python guy work on all of the, the, the data science type stuff if that's their particular background. Or you let them build the web front end that's talking over HTTP to the Java back end where she's really, really accustomed to working with relational databases. And then you let the person who's really comfortable with, say, .NET store some of this stuff into, say, Azure Cosmos DB from each according to their abilities to each according to its needs. There's a fair number of you who are listening to this who are probably sitting there with their arms folded and their legs crossed and glaring at me. Mm. This could never work. This could never work. There's no possible way this could ever work. Bah, humbug. Right? Come on, show of hands if you're one of those. Yeah, nobody wants to admit it. That's fair. No, that's totally fair. Tell that to the Republican Party in the U.S. Back in uh, Obama's, I believe it was his first election campaign, they took a, they, they, I mean, American election campaigns, it's basically all volunteer driven. There are a number of professionals at the highest levels of management within the team, but after that, it's all volunteers. And Obama, in particular, wanted to try to harness the power of technology and the internet and so forth, and so he said, hey, if you're in IT and you want to volunteer for my campaign, here's, here's where you email. And they got a huge collection of people with zero in common with respect to technology. What they ended up building was a system that processed four gigabytes per second, 10,000 requests per second, consisting of 2,000 nodes, three data centers, 180 terabytes of data, eight and a half billion requests. The whole thing was built, deployed, and dismantled in a year and a half. And there was no overarching architectural document they were literally folding things in. If you want to get right down to it, it was a glorious hack from start to finish. And it worked. So, practically speaking, how many people are familiar with Haskell? A couple of hands. Cool. That's about par for the course. This is a Haskell list. I'm going to teach you a little bit of Haskell, just so that you feel like you learned something out of this keynote. It's a pretty straightforward concept. Notice the square brackets, kind of makes it look like a, a standard array in like C++ or C Sharp or Java, et cetera. But this is actually a linked list under the hood. Pretty straightforward, yeah? List of three elements. And Haskell is a functional programming language, so we don't have objects. We have functions that know how to operate on various data elements. And so, for example, there are several functions in Haskell. By the way, this syntax here, that's their comment syntax. So here, when I take the head of that list, what I'm getting is the first element out of that list, which was the number one. That makes sense, right? <coughs> and when I say I want the last, that gives me the last element of the list, which in that case was three. Now, notice that this is different than asking for everything except the head, which is tail, the tail of a list, says strip off the head and give me everything else that remains. So in this particular case, when I say tail on numbers, what I get back is a list consisting of two and three. And if I were to ask a tail of that, I would get a list of three. And if I were to ask of a tail of that, I would get an empty list. So it makes sense? 
Notice also there is a take function that says, I want to take the first two of this list, which in itself will be a list, so I'll get the numbers one and two in a list out of that original list of one, two, three. So far, pretty straightforward stuff? Yeah? Cool. Now, one of the other things that Haskell allows us to do is to create a range of values without having to specify them all individually. So here, from 1 to 100, so that means 1 to 100 inclusive, so we've got 100 numbers in that list. Notice the double dots there, that indicates the range. And if we want to do something other than just simple sequential, we can indicate a pattern before using the range to indicate the, the, the remainder. So here, two, four, this is enough to say we want to get just the even numbers up through 100. So far, so good? Now, one of the things we frequently want to do is we want to do operations on this list. This is where we start using what Haskell calls list comprehensions. This is where we take a particular function and we apply it to each element on the list, which will give us some kind of result. Frequently, it'll be another list. So here, basically, I'm saying, give me the values 1 through 10 and put them into x. And in this case, I'm just going to keep that. Here, though, give me the values 1 through 10, put that into x, and then I'm going to ask x to multiply itself. So that's going to give me a list of the squares of 1 through 10. Anybody ever done FizzBuzz? The whole FizzBuzz program, right? You know, let, let me go through a list of numbers. If the number is divisible by three, print Fizz. If it's divisible by five, print Buzz. If it's divisible by both, print FizzBuzz. Yeah, that's basically one long list comprehension in Haskell. And notice the if else, this actually returns a value. So here, when I say if x mod five is equal to zero, then print out both, else print out buzz. In this case, I'm, I'm just doing a variation of fizzbuzz, where if it's divisible by five, divisible by three, or divisible by four. And then, of course, take the values, one through 25, plug it into x, and run it through this little three-part if statement over and over and over and over and over again until I get a list out the other end. We can also create an infinite list. An infinite list is one that, as its name implies, never ends. So that forever list up there will, in fact, never terminate. If I try to print the contents of that list, um, I will be sitting at my laptop for a very, very, very long time. Now think about this for just a second. How do you do an infinite list in Java? Because in Java, we always think about lists as collections. Each of those values exists in memory. And if I try to have an infinite sized collection in memory, well, we have a problem. Notice we can also do this off of a single element. So here, cycle, love, that means basically that I'm going to infinitely spin on top of the contents of that list, which in this case is one element. So when I try to, however many elements I want to take from that forever love, it will always just continue to give love. Pun intended. That's really bizarre. I mean, what possible use do you have for the concept of an infinite list? one that never terminates. I mean, forget the implications of how do we actually make this work. Obviously, Haskell does some kind of weird magic under the scenes, but how, what would you use this for? Haskell, by the way, refers to these as streams. They don't call them infinite lists, they call them streams. Several other functional languages have the same concept and they use the same terminology. But if you think about it, what's at work here is the notion that everything in the collection, everything in the stream has to be realized, has to exist before we start working with it. Think about this for a moment. 
if you were going to write a program that were going to print out the lines in a file and the file was still being written to, would you ever print anything? Well, no, not if we try to do the, the canonical naive thing in Java or in C Sharp where we say load all of the lines into a collection, into a list, and then iterate over that list, what we would do is we would approach the problem differently. We would read characters up until we hit a carriage return, and then print that, and then go back and read the next set of characters until we hit a carriage return and print that. And there, we're not really working off the concept of a traditional collection. What we're saying is we are building a thing an iterator, dare I say, that knows how to go get the next element in the sequence. I don't want to call it a collection because it's not a collection. It's a sequence of values, though, some of which haven't been created yet. And we can do this certainly in Java, for example, using the Java collections syntax. So here, I'm creating something, an iterable, that knows how to produce an iterator that in this case will constantly continue to give me even numbers and the only termination condition is right here and has next. As a matter of fact, I could have this thing give me even numbers all the way up until we rotate into negative numbers just by always returning true and letting integer overflow just happen. Now, using it in Java, here I'm just creating one of those evens iterator. And again, if this is infinite, we're going to have the same basic problem as the infinite list in Haskell. But the key thing is the iterator understands where to go get the value next. So here I can create a file iterator that will do exactly as I just described. Let me go to the file, get a line, hand it back, and when you ask for the next line, I'll go get that line and hand it back. We don't slurp the entire file into memory. Heavens no, that would be inefficient. But we can still use the iterable concept and the iterator logic to walk through the contents of a file so that from the perspective of the person using this code, it looks like a collection, it feels like a collection, and if, for example, we block waiting for additional lines to be written to this file, so what? We would want to do that if we were waiting for new lines to be written anyway. Start entertaining this notion, and you start getting down some really, really interesting ideas. Now, I can't claim credit for any of this. I didn't invent any of this. All of this was largely done by functional languages long before I discovered them. Again, Haskell has had this concept in place for quite some time. But the people who worked on the Guava library over at Google, they knew about them too. And they captured a lot of these concepts in the iterables and iterators class in the Guava library. Brian Getz is no fool either. He said, hey, I'm standing up here at the top of the Java pyramid as I sit here and think about what we should do with the language and libraries next. And so he led the group that actually created Java Util Stream. If you're a .NET developer, well, this was basically Anders Halsberg and Eric Meyer before him, and they implemented a lot of this in Link, the, lang the, the language integrated query and other languages have since followed suit in a variety of different ways. But go back to that thought of infinite lists for a second. Is there really an infinite stream? Is there really an infinite sequence? As long as you think about it in purely numeric terms, no. Because, I mean, whether it's a 32, 64, 128, 256, bit platform, eventually you'll run out of numbers. But what if we cast our net a little bit wider? What if we start thinking about things that just haven't happened yet, 
as a sequence of events. What if we think about time as a sequence? User input. Literally, will the world ever run out of mouse clicks? Will the world ever run out of character events, people typing on a keyboard, or mouse movement? These are all effectively infinite streams. Well, I mean, technically, at some point, somebody will turn off the computer, and at that point, the user input stream will end, but so will your program. These are infinite streams for all intents and purposes. Push notifications from the server are also an infinite stream. Matter of fact, data being fed from the server is an infinite stream. If you work at a space agency, the satellite imagery that comes down from several miles above us or from the Mars rover, that's all an infinite stream of data. It's a constant sequence of data that's always hitting us. Those are infinite streams. And when you start going down this path, you find yourself basically a half step away from fully understanding the notion of reactive programming. And all of this started with a Haskell list. See, there are all these amazing ideas out there on all these different languages, on all these different platforms that you don't know are there unless you deliberately go out and cultivate a polytechnical mindset. So how do you do this? Assuming I've convinced you, how do you do this as an individual? Well, one of the things we have to bear in mind is there's a practical reality that you have to be able to have a job and that the place that you work at may not share some of your polytechnical beliefs. And that's quite all right, because as I said, once you understand some of these concepts, as you saw with the Java iterators, it's possible to pull those ideas over without having to actually embrace said other language. The whole reactive world was built around concepts that the functional guys have been wrestling with for many, many years. And reactive programming is definitely something that you can do in a variety of environments. As a matter of fact, you can build an entire user interface concept around it. And thus do we have React, or more recently, Flutter which is the cross-platform mobile toolkit that Google now offers for doing both iOS and Android. Your goal, in many respects, is to become what the recruiters will often refer to as the T-shaped individual, where you have some depth in a variety of topics, but you also have some breadth across a variety of topics. So in some cases, you may say, you know what, uh, my company, who I don't want to leave, is very, very invested into the Java ecosystem. So I will understand Java and the JVM and so forth. Those are gonna be my deep topics. But I'm also gonna spend some time learning about other programming languages, some of which may run on top of the JVM, some of which may not. And we may be heavily invested in relational databases, but I will also learn about graph databases and document store databases and so on and so forth. Because those ideas will filter into your code as you go. Your goal is to become this T-shaped individual for some breadth and some depth. Now, the only way you're going to get there, very bluntly, is with your own feet. Your company will not pay you to learn these things. I mean, if you happen to work at one of those companies that does, that's awesome. That is so cool, and more companies should do that. But even then, the company will be making some decisions about what they will train you on that may or may not fit with your particular T-shape. If the company I work at, for example, decides to host a class on introductory functional programming, yeah, that's great for everybody else, but I've actually done a bunch of functional programming, so that class doesn't really help me. I would actually rather take a class, if possible, on constrained logic programming, constrained logic programming, Prolog and so forth, which they might not even realize they need to offer as a class. So ultimately, it's going to be you who's going to have to do this. Now, congratulations, you've already started because you're here. 
So you're already, at least at some level, bought into this idea. But the next thing you need to do is, as you embrace each of these new things, you need to figure them out, but without having to spend six months to become an expert in this. You need to create your own classification system. What exactly is a graph database, and why should I care? What exactly is Go, and why should I care? What is Rust, and how is Rust different from Go, and why should I care? For me personally, what I will do is I will play around with the technology. My goal is to get, at least in the early stage, when I first see a thing, is try to figure it out so I can sum it up in two sentences, like I did a few minutes ago with Flutter. It's a cross-platform mobile development toolkit developed by Google that utilizes functional UI concepts similar to that of React. Now, if you've never looked at Flutter, congratulations, you now have a brief but fairly straightforward idea of how Flutter works, of how Flutter, where it fits in the overall space of things. It's a native implementation, it's not a web-based implementation, et cetera, et cetera. These are things you can get from the Flutter homepage. And then when somebody comes to you and says, hey, we really, really need to build a new uh, mobile app and we need it to work across both iOS and Android, and uh, we, we don't really want to take the time to try and uh, uh, you know, write two separate code bases, but the whole idea of doing this as a web application running you know, inside of the mobile space, yeah, also not. You're thinking in your head, this sounds like this Flutter would be a good case for this. And then at that point, you start diving more deeply into Flutter. Whether or not you bring it up to your boss, your peer, whomever brought this project up, that's up to you. I'm personally okay with saying, you know what, I've heard of this thing, I don't know if it's right, but I'm willing to take a couple of weeks to figure it out. And when I take that couple of weeks to figure it out, I literally want to build a small but non-trivial application. Hello world, Pfft, everybody can do a hello world. They have bots that can do hello world at this point. Build something that has meaning to you, but that isn't just a, an existing sample. So for example, for Flutter, my family, we like to play cards. We like to play hearts and we like to play spades. And for whatever reason, I'm the one that's always keeping score. So after every round, I have to sit down, grab the pad of paper, ask everybody what they got, total things up, et cetera, et cetera. This is a perfect mobile app. So I'm building a hearts scorer and a spades scorer in Flutter. And I've discovered some things about Flutter. For example, doing UI layout is very, very different in Flutter than it is in any of the other mobile technologies, which I wouldn't have gotten just by reading their website, but by actually trying to do something, trying to build something non-trivial, it's like, oh, wow. This is kind of different. And I know how I'd do it in an MVC traditional toolkit, but this is not what Flutter does. So how do I do this in Flutter? I'm building my own ontology. I'm building my own categorization scheme for where Flutter fits in the giant picture. The other thing I will advocate to you is if you are a traditionally classical object-oriented developer, don't study another traditionally object-oriented language. If you're a Java dev, don't learn C Sharp. I mean, there's some interesting things that Microsoft is doing with C Sharp, but most of them are things that are at least being discussed in the Java world anyway. That's boring. That's just boring. Go learn Scala. Go learn Clojure. Go learn Yeti. This is actually a programming language that is very heavily inspired by ML, the programming language ML, the functional language ML, not machine learning. Or if you really, really, really have it just, ah, oh, I've got to do something that lets me put AI and machine learning on my resume, go Google probabilistic programming languages. Programming languages that intrinsically take probability into account, generally used for simulation and so forth. Go do something completely different. 
It will feel good to go learn a new language that is exactly like the one you're already using. But feeling good is only going to last for a little while. You're not going to get any huge revelations. The goal here is to broaden your scope, to widen your vision, to go visit places you've never been, like Waffle House. Now, generally speaking, what I will suggest to people is create your own evaluation function. What I mean by that is, let's assume that I want to study this particular language. Um, what can I build with it? Well, if I'm currently not feeling at all inspired, like the hearts and spades score, my fallback will be a gaming convention registration website. Because for a couple of years, I was involved in the technology around a gaming convention in Seattle called Dragonflight. And this was an actual problem we had to solve. And in some respects, it's a straight up CRUD problem. I need to take submissions in, store it to a database. If you want to host a game, we need to figure out the game title, the description, who you are, how many people it can play, etc. We need to display all of those. It sounds very much like a traditional CRUD app. So it's not too far from a traditional CRUD app. That's a good thing. But it has some interesting quirks to it. Like certain games are longer than others. And so when we schedule, this is actually something of a constrained logic problem. And so if the language is particularly build, built well for constrained logic, then great, this lets me have that flexibility. Or if I want to see somehow about trying to connect the various attendees with the people who are hosting games and so forth, that's actually more of a graph-oriented problem. Does not matter what I think, it's a problem. It, the evaluation function is a problem of your creation so that you are the domain expert, so that you don't have to ask anybody any questions, you can just start working on this. And truthfully, you may get a couple of days into learning Prologue and go, ah, this is not at all what I thought this was. And that's okay. Put it down, walk away, go learn something else. There's no shame in turning away from learning something if it doesn't start like exciting you or if it doesn't start giving you answers. But what if you're the boss? What if you're the manager in charge of this team and you want your team to become more polytechnical? Because in many respects, that's what we as managers should be doing. We should be encouraging our people to grow. Well, for starters, go find people who are polytechnical within your company and encourage them. Just because you're using Java doesn't mean that everything you do should be Java-centric. Find somebody who's got some experience with Haskell and say, hey, would you mind giving us a brown bag? This is a term we use in the US to refer to a bring your lunch and somebody will stand up during the lunch hour and talk about a particular topic. Company I worked at prior to this, we did a brown bag every Thursday. Every Thursday, somebody had a new topic that they were discussing. Now, technically, we wanted to encourage people to go to these, so we didn't require you to bring your lunch. We bought pizza. And we got pretty good turnout. And a lot of people learned a lot of new, interesting ideas through those. But the other thing is, establish a culture of dissent. One of the things that companies really stress is we've got to make sure everybody agrees before we move forward. That's bullshit. Everybody doesn't have to agree. Everybody has to simply do what has been decided. Quite honestly, I've had people that I've worked for in the past make decisions that I thought were entirely wrong. But once the decision was made, professional ethics said, OK, now I will support that decision to the best of my ability. Because one of the things about dissent is it will call out any flaws in the conversation. Currently, I, I am a director at Quicken Loans. And if I get my team and a variety of teams into a room and I say, hey, this is a plan, everybody in the room will go, okay, this is the plan. Great plan, boss, great plan. Because inside, they're thinking, I'm not sure about that, but he's the boss. I don't want to say anything. There's a power imbalance. There's a dynamic there when you're the boss and everybody else is not. 
So one of the things that I will do is I will put up a plan and I will say, tell me what's wrong with this plan. Tell me all the things I'm not thinking about. Tell me all the things that I've forgotten. Tell me the places where it's not going to work. Dissent. Tell me out loud in front of the room why this might not work. Because I would rather find that out now than six to nine months from now when it blows up gloriously on the launch pad. Build a culture of dissent for your team. In some cases, set some non-business goals that are technology focused. For the engineering team I built, these were a bunch of first, second year engineering folks. In other words, these were new developers, brand new to the, to the industry. In some cases, we hired them directly out of a code camp. Many of them needed to level up their technical skills, and we knew it. My boss, who was the senior vice president at the time, we both knew it, that if we hired these people, if we were looking for juniors, we were going to have to level them up ourselves. So we literally started a book club. Everybody on my team, I bought them copies of a book on JavaScript, modern JavaScript, uh, and we literally, every Wednesday, I think it was, every week, we went out, we went to wherever they wanted to go. They all selected for a pizza place because programmers and pizza, it's this wild addiction. And we sat there for an hour and a half in this pizza parlor, going over chapter by chapter every topic in this book. Make learning a formal part of the company's business. Set technical goals. By the end of next month, we will all have finished Venkat Subramaniam's uh, JavaScript book. And by the end of the month after that, everybody will have completed six JavaScript puzzles on one of your favorite coding websites. And at the end of the month after that, we will start learning something different. But the other thing that you need to do as the boss is you need to figure out what your company does. What is your company's core business? What are the things that you actually sell? If this went away tomorrow, your company would start to go bankrupt. And understand that sometimes for these bigger companies, there isn't just one core business. But for example, if you're at Amazon, your core business used to be the big, big e-commerce website. Now, mm -mm. their core business is AWS. Their core business is technology. You could argue that Amazon's core business is actually logistics. Amazon knows how to put a package on your doorstep within 24 hours, 48 hours at the most, that that's actually what they have built the strength of their company on. But if you were watching Amazon's recent announcements regarding Alexa in everything, they're putting them in earbuds, they're putting it in microphones, they're putting it in every possible electronic device you can imagine, it's pretty clear that Bezos wants to take over the world. I mean, he wants to enable technology for everybody out there. Their core business is changing. And if you work for them, then you want to understand how that change is happening so that you can adjust your team to change with it. The last thing you really need to do if you're running that team is you need to accept and embrace the idea that these, these are people, these are not cogs. One of the first things that I do when I start hiring for a team is I start looking at the current team and I start asking myself, what's the biggest weakness? So the team that I'm building at Quicken Loans, right now it consists of me. What's my biggest weakness? I don't know mortgage. I don't know mortgage. I've only been with the company for a month. I don't really know the company well, but the biggest problem is I don't know mortgage. So the first two people, ideally, that I use to, to staff up this team will be internal transfers, people coming from other parts of the company that do understand what we do and how we do it. And as a matter of fact, one of the guys, basically, once the paperwork goes through, he will start working for me. Now, what's my next biggest weakness? Well, the company is large enough that we actually are fairly insulated. 
We are pretty inward looking. The company as a whole doesn't do a great job looking to the outside, looking at technologies and so forth that are coming from the outside. So how do I fight that within my team? I make sure to hire people who are broad thinkers, who are polytechnical from the outside. Data is a very, very big concern for what we do. So I really want to have somebody on my team who's really strong with understanding data, data access, data uh, re relationships, all of that stuff. Somebody who's spent a fair amount of time, in this case, this is a .NET shop, so somebody who's spent a fair amount of time with SQL Server, and actually he'll start on Monday. You need to build your team based on individualism, letting each individual bring their disparate skills to bear, rather than saying, I want people who are five years Java, seven years Oracle, three years Angular. Yeah, you're just gonna get a bunch of people that look exactly the same. And it may be great in the beginning, but over time, there's a whole bunch of breadth that you're missing because you didn't hire a diverse team to begin with. This is not easy. I'm not going to stand here and tell you that, you know, you could do this in your sleep. This is hard, both as an individual and as a manager. But it's worth it. Because in the end, you will see things that others do not see. You will know things that others do not know. And that will make you infinitely more valuable than the people who are classic Java full stack developers. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Peace out.